It is crunch time in this CSW division. We're going to see Matthew O'Connor versus Ben Schoenbrunn, and I'll go ahead and warn our audience right now. This is a uh, this is going to be a brutal game to watch because both of these players invoke Benji mode on their racks. They take their tiles and they turn them sideways, upside down, all the different orientations. So we're all going to be uh, practicing some neck exercises here. Get those uh get those ninety degree bends up and ready to go because this is going to be a fun one. We're going to cut back to the board as Matthew has found his way back to his chair. And we are ready to go here. <coughs> Excuse me. Ben to play first. Matthew to respond. We'll see. I just want a good game of Scrabble. We've had a lot of drubbings at this tournament, but we've had a couple good ones. Matthew, I think, giving us our best game of the tournament in a win yesterday over Joshua Castellano. And Ben to go first here. You can already see Benji mode is a go as we've got a sideways T, a sideways V the other way. It is Benji mode here at Lake George, New York. And I think he's got yet yeah, VVIJNRT. This is an instant exchange, right, Charles? Yeah, and there's no question. You can't get rid of both Vs. You can barely get rid of one V. You can get rid of the J and keep two Vs. None of that is worth doing. Probably exchange JVV here. Um, you have to do some analysis on leave quality, but maybe keeping I and T, uh, but T, I, and R, good synergy. I think this is the right exchange. Yeah, I think you hold I and R, T as well. Um, so V, V, J, the exchange for Ben on the first turn. And Matthew has an interesting choice now. A, A, G, I, N, S, S, his rec. So he is also invoking Benji mode here. And after an exchange three, that can mean a couple different things, but typically if your opponent wants to hold four of those tiles, they're pretty good tiles. INRT is actually kind of a lower end outcome. You expect things like EIRT fairly often, AERT as well, or God forbid a blank or an S on their rack. So if you're Matthew, you don't want to give a lot of floaters. You assume that uh, your opponent's quite close to bingo range and every letter you give your opponent gives more chances for an eight letter word. I think we're going to see exchange one from Matthew O'Connor here. And as much as I would love to exchange that diagonal S, uh, it's going to probably be an exchange of an A here, if I had to guess. Matthew's going to think long and hard about this one. Um, but I think exchange one, exchange A is the move here. What say you, Charles? Uh, I like either exchange A or exchange AS, honestly. Certainly playing through after an exchange three from Ben is not what you want to do if you're Matthew. Uh, you, you don't, as Matt said, you don't want to give uh, letters for bingos, especially considering that all of the letters that Matt has are good bingo letters. Aside from perhaps the G, any letter that he puts out there is going to make Ben's life easier, not harder. So we do see an exchange one. I think we agree with this, just exchanging the A. Now Ben has a choice. Does he make a play like, uh, I think, Bitor is a word? B-I-T-T-O-R, or does he just count her exchange again? Uh, we'll see what he decides. Man, Bitor gives four very lucrative floaters for your opponent, but exchange one, your opponent has a seven a lot of the time, but Bitor, your opponent, almost certain to bingo. If they missed the seven, they'll hit the eight. The other thing to think about here is Matthew did spend over a minute and a half before exchanging. And if you know anything about Matthew O'Connor, you know the book is that he is a very fast player. So what made him spend so much time? Why was that such a hard exchange? Uh, anyway, Ben exchanges again, which I do think makes sense in the situation given the context. And then Matthew did pick up his seven. Massing is going to come down into the assign leave. And Matthew's going to jump out to a lead after three turns of nothing. We see a big score here for Matthew O'Connor and Ben A I N O R R T the lead or the the pull here for him. Are you seeing any bingos here, Charles? Uh, I'm off the top of my head. I am not. I'm thinking an E would be great for anterior. And if you're Ben, you're thinking, oh, certainly I'm going to get an E if my opponent's bingoing. They've got to be giving me an E, right? Uh, but not in this case. And uh, so I don't see anything that plays. I think we've got Quackle up and we were confirming that there are no pl playable bingos for Ben, which is uh, kind of a tough break, but he's going to spend some time here to make sure that that's the case. 
I think this goes back to his last play. I don't know that I was a fan of holding on to the O. I think I prefer to hold INRT to INRTO. Maybe I'm crazy, but um, you know that O just doesn't seem to synergize particularly well with the rest of those tiles. And this is what's ended up happening here. I'm actually going to put up, uh, pull up the uh, cross tables leave evaluator. We're going to actually get some numbers on this. Um, yeah, let's go to school. INORT has a value of 9.4, INRT 7.5. So I guess in a vacuum, INORT actually does have enough synergy to evaluate slightly better. And that might also be because you only draw two tiles to it rather than three. So yeah, uh, kind of a close, a close call there. And Ben's got to make a really hard choice now. It's so easy to get, you know, tunnel vision. I've been trying to bingo for two turns with these small exchanges. Um, now I just want to drop OR somewhere, right? Play GOR. He can also score 25 right now by playing a Roint and a Massing, should he notice that hook. So he can blow it all up, score 25 now and say, forget about it. Or he can keep things tight and small, play OR or O-A-R and amassing if he wants to hold that I-N-R-T leave one more time. What would you do here? Would you blow it all up? Would you play long and score points? Or would you make a smaller intermediate play? Uh, at this point, given the, the score, I would probably make this a smaller intermediate play. Um, a roint doesn't net you enough points to justify the fact that you're basically leaving your bingo chances to complete chance. Um, Ben putting the R here, playing both R's for Roar. I actually don't know if I agree with that. There's tons of E's in the bag to make the INRT leave extremely compelling. And uh, he's also got the ING for from the G in amassing. And drawing one more tile just makes it more likely that you draw a clunker, the, the V that he already saw earlier, the J, the Q. Um, I like OR better than Roar for sure. Yeah, I would not play Roar. If I'm going to do this, I'd play Or. Um, but Ben plays more Roar, and Matthew is going to whiff on a bingo this turn, um, which Ooh, wow. is uncharacteristic for players of this caliber at this tier. And he went pretty quick on that, too. The bingo played through the G at the bottom of the board. Mute this now if you want to take some more time to look for it. The bingo was Biograph, and he's going to get punished very, very hard for his mistake as Ben has pulled the Z and is going to drop it down for 71 points Z-E-I-N. That Z is so, so powerful, especially in the CSW lexicon and uh, Ben demonstrating exactly why. So a frustrating start. You expect when you exchange down to I-N-R-T, you're going to bingo sometime in the first like four or five turns of the game and Ben still hasn't done so. But Zine has to be a pretty good consolation prize for him as he pulls back close into this game, 88 to 103. And Matthew has not found good tiles after his missed bingo last turn. The leave of AIPR met with AEI on the pull, not what he was looking for. And he's going to have himself a challenging turn here. AIA seems to make the most sense to play off. You can do that playing NAN and GI or you can score one more point playing it just to the left of amassing Ben and AG. But the second placement, the one that scores one more, gives a ton of options back to your opponent. What are you looking to do here, Charles? Uh, definitely, and we, we saw this in the first game of the day where AIA is just such a helpful word in Collins. Uh, NWL viewers will be um, aghast and probably a little bit envious to find out about the existence of that word. Um, in terms of where I would play it, certainly playing it to the left of amassing, uh, scoring one more point, you know, in a vacuum, that's better. But setting up that huge triple letter score where basically every high scoring letter uh, works nicely in that spot, you, you just don't want to do something like that. So I'm, I'm thinking slotting it in between amassing and zine. Uh, you can even play it to the right of zine, set up another easy bingo lane for yourself. Um, Part of the idea with AIA would be to keep bingo prone tiles. And the point of, you know, keeping bingo prone tiles is you need a spot to bingo once you draw the bingo with your bingo prone tiles. So uh, that would be an option as well. 
hard turns. These turns are always super hard. Um, when you're kind of close to bingos, how much do I need to groom my rack? How, you know, do I want to keep the best possible leave of AEPR? Am I okay holding an eye to go with that? Is it better to hold an eye to go with that? Do I want to score 22 or 10? These are so hard, these turns right here, these intermediate turns. And yet these are what separate the cream of the crop from everybody else. Anybody can sit there and learn 20,000 sevens and eights. There's a lot of people who have, but you've got to learn how to play the game and play it tactically as well. Yeah, and uh, you can you can tell that this is uh, requiring some thinking from Matthew because he, he basically insta-played Bo, B-O-H, missing a bingo. Uh, he is not insta-playing something here. He is taking his time to evaluate the board and his leaves and the score, everything that you have to combine to make the correct play. Here it's not clear-cut. Uh, here is a good spot to spend some time, although we always caution don't get bogged down here in the early game. Don't use too much of your clock when you'll need it for tough end game calculations, possibly at the end. I love doing commentary on Scrabble on exactly these turns because I would sit there over the board and just like pull my hair out, have no idea what to do. Think about all the ways each of my options is going to backfire on me. If I play AIA on the left, I know I'm going to get hit with like some dumb W play for 40 points. If I play AIA on the right, I know I'm going to draw an unplayable bingo next turn. If I end up scoring 30 or 30, or, you know, 20 or 25 out of this turn and blowing up the rack, I know I'm going to draw UUV. So, you know, it's hard not to get in your own head in the game of Scrabble. And these turns are so aggravating. And I just, I like being in the commentator booth. I don't have to make these decisions anymore. I'm a lot more comfortable here sipping my coffee and telling other people what they should or shouldn't do. Oh, so he, he's, I, I, I kind of like this from Matt. He is completely blowing up the rack. He, he evaluated that the leaves he can keep are not good enough to justify, you know, the closed board and the low scores. He's just going to play as many tiles as he can and hopefully, you know, blanks, blanks and S's. That's, that's the goal with a play like this. So Prairie the play, and this is something too that shows some of the interesting schools of thought across the years in Scrabble. Back in the 1980s, uh, tile turnover was all the rage. Play as many tiles as I can, try to draw the blanks, because if I get both blanks, I'm not going to lose. And then in the 1990s, early 2000s, especially with the advent of computer analysis, we saw actually don't play a lot of tiles, but keep all the good ones. A lot of the tiles in the bag are bad. Hold on to A-E-R-T, E-I-R-T, groom your rack, and try to bingo twice a game, three times a game. If you do, you're not going to lose. And so we actually saw a shift over to smaller plays very often, and probably, in my opinion, what was overfishing in the Scrabble scene, where now we're playing too small and too tight, and everybody's just trying to bingo all day. And Matthew's play a little bit of a refreshing shift back to the old guard. I'm going for turnover again. I'm not getting bogged down with these one pointers that don't score. Give me some letters that I can get some points with. And he has found one by drawing the X here. Ben is a hard turn, but he's likely just going to play off a lot of these tiles, as we saw last turn from Matthew. All of these score one. You hate scoring 20 points in a Collins game where the average points per move is what, like 40, something like that, 42. So, you know, you got to get rid of some of this stuff and work through it, or you must bingo next turn. You could fish OO here, or Ben was looking to play Oolite. Uh, it's anagram Thule also plays to that E. I think you've got to play a six to the E in this situation here. You can't get caught up fishing, and Ben seems to agree with Oolite. Do you like this play, Charles? Yeah, I think this this is clearly the correct play. Fishing nets you very few points if you play off OO. The EIL and T leave, while well, it's pretty good on this board, not a lot of floaters for eight letter words, which might be the strength of that leave. So maybe a little bit pointless here. We, he's kind of doing the same thing that Matthew did last turn, which is just play a bunch of tiles. Score basically as good as you can and hope for things to look up for you in the future. 
I wonder if an OO fish making OI and OR made some sense. That leaves this board very open. It holds the ING combination to try to hit a massing, but I am almost always anti-fishing. That's my personal uh, philosophy and approach to this game. Uh, I wouldn't do it. I like this play of Oolite. Just get through this stuff. Let me find tiles that score points and let me score points with them. Now, Ben hasn't found tiles that score points. He's found all one-pointers yet again. But despite not fishing, he's found a bingo, A-N-E-S, A-E-N-E-O-U-S. So he'll be scoring big points next turn. And Matthew, I don't know what he's thinking about here. To me, it looks so obviously apparent that you play AX and XI to the left side of Prairie. I would have made that play within four seconds. Matthew, typically a fast player. What do you think he's thinking about here, Charles? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of in the dark on this one too. Uh, AX is quite straightforward. Oh, he, no, this is actually a decent idea. He probably figures the X spot will stay open next turn and he's shedding some of the clunkier stuff. I'd be interested okay. to see how that sims, but uh, that's a decent idea. Yeah, I'm not going to run the sim right now. I'm going to try to stay on with the coverage, but I am very curious about that. That's that's interesting. Uh, I wonder, too, we've seen several word knowledge mistakes from Ben already. And Yura does not take an S. It takes two back hooks, an L and an N, but does not take an S. So perhaps this is a little bit of bait. Matthew trying to set a trap here, too. Um, but Ben draws into Aeneas. He's going to play it in the spot that scores the most points. He can also play it for 72 instead of the 74 he gets for this one by making Anuran. Or he can play it for 70 on top, making AR and playing from the R and Roar. Um, but this is his highest scoring option, albeit a little bit dangerous. But I think you, you probably grab the points in this situation. And Ben... Gonna bingo halfway through the game with two unseen blanks. If he's able to draw one here, he's gonna be at a big advantage in this game. What's he found? He's found one of those Vs he exchanged on the first turn, and Matthew's got the other. They gotta shake this bag a little more, I think. And a bunch of garbage. Wow. Ouch. Okay. Yeah, so both players are a bit bogged down here. Well, Matthew's got the VG combo. Ben's got the VU combo plus a bunch of junk. Uh, it might be a couple turns before we see another bingo, but we, we like these short tactical plays as well. Possibly more interesting to commentate than just bingo, 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 game's over. Nobody had to think that this is a bit more exciting. Yeah, uh, some people do play Scrabble so that they can think. Some people just like spelling cool words. Everybody has a different reason to play this game. Me, I hate myself, and that's why I play Scrabble. I love the punishment. I love that feeling of drawing three U's and a W. It just makes me feel really good. Yeah, I mean, Matt, if it makes you feel good, is that really punishment? It's some sort of perverse uh, sadomachic. I'm not going to say it, but you know what I'm getting at. I do know what you're getting at. Perhaps I'm just a glutton for punishment. I don't know. Uh, speaking of punishment, here is that X play. Matthew did not cash this in last turn, but he is going to drop AXED this turn. Look at that leave. VGT, and they're all oriented in different directions. So if he can find a tile that is placed pointing to the right, he will complete the Benji bingo and uh, get uh, letters in every different direction. Benji mode activated. All right, oh, Axe comes down, 42 points. We have a tie game, 183 to 183. What was the point of those first six turns for each of us? We are right back in the thick of it now. B-M-O-P-T-U-V is the rack for Ben. He has 43 points available. Typically in CSW, when you see EX, you're looking at putting the O behind it to make XO. But the O actually needs to go on the other side of EX for his best play here. T-O-M-B, making Tex and 1, scores 43. The V-U-P leave is awful, but 43 is so good. You've got to play it, right? Yeah, you, you, you've got to take the points. Uh, P-U-V might be right up there with the worst leaves that we've seen kept at this tournament. I guess I can't 
bring to mind a complete list of those leaves, but PUV, that is just crushingly bad. Uh, your your next turn valuation just completely goes in the toilet with a, a leaf like that. But on this board, th there's some points available. You take those points. Yeah, you've got to grab points here, especially after the play I think we're going to see from Matthew next turn. These points are going to be very valuable. So the play from Ben puts him ahead by 43. And Matthew now has found the first blank in the bag, but not a lot of goodies to go with it. E-G-I-J-T-V blank on his rack. And uh, I think Jiver to the R in Prairie is the best move here. It seems a little bit wild if you're Matthew to block almost every floater on this board when you are in bingo range and your opponent just took a long time to make what looks like a very obvious play of tomb. Uh, to me, that says my opponent aggravated over this, um, did not want to make this play, and probably has a bad leave because of it. So I'm in bingo range. I don't think my opponent does. I don't want to block the floaters, but this rack is just so inflexible. E-G-I-J-T-V blank. Like, I think you have to play Jiger. I just don't see many other compelling options to score points. If you want to be nuts and give us some stream content, though, J-A and Jive down at the bottom of the board would be fun, albeit very stupid. Yeah, that, that's kind of an indefensible play. I actually like, uh, I was going to say, I like Jig making JA next to Anura, keeping ETV with the O and the I open of Oolite. That actually probably bingos a fair amount of the time. Meanwhile, the leave that Matt is keeping here of EGTV blank, uh, somewhat uh, dismal bingo, bingo letters. You score more points with this position of jig, but sacrifice some bingo chances. The benefit of the other positioning of jig is it sets up an S-hook for you. Uh, the board is quite short on S-hooks, given that Enura does not take an S. Yeah, so uh, Matthew proving there is no God in Scrabble, only pain as he picks up QY. He would have needed a nice draw to find a bingo there, but QY is about as insulting as it gets. So Matthew may be going to send this one right back to the kitchen. Or, oh, this is a word, Q-U-Y-T-E. Is that what that is, Charles? Uh, yeah, that must be the play here. Uh, uh, that is not a word. Uh, that's why it's catching us a little bit off guard. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm in the wrong lexicon. It is a word. I got to get my Zizvo to Collins. Um, so horrible leave, um, but is cashing in the blank for bingo. So with those bad letters, uh, certainly worth it. Yeah, yeah, clear in a way the best play for Matthew there. It's going to give back QI plays to Ben, and this is going to be a test of his word knowledge does he know a bunch of random sixes? Because he's got several that will play beneath that Q. Um, he's got Plutei, P-L-U-T-E-I. He's got its anagram Putelei, P-U-T-E-L-I. And he's got the six letter L-O-U-P-I-T. Each of those plays beneath quite for either 35 or 36 points. You've got to do that, right, Charles? Yeah, definitely the the... The singular hot spot on this board is the spot underneath the QI or making QI. Uh, Q U Y T E does take a D and an S, but Ben doesn't have any way to address that spot. At least not not in any way that scores any decent amount of points. So playing underneath certainly a good idea here. Tulip is also a, a reasonable choice. Gets a little more uh, points on the scoreboard by using the P there. Uh, OE, kind of a neutral leaf, so Tulip looks pretty good as well. This is going to be crazy. I think we're going to see something I've never seen before in my life. Uh, Matthew cashed in one blank on a 70-point non-bingo last turn. He might do it again this turn. A w blank DY and Quited plays for 60. The blank would be an A, W, A, D, Y. Um, so Matthew may burn both blanks in consecutive non-bingo plays. And it's not like the board is, you know, lacking bingo lines. It's just Matthew's racks have been so abysmal that he has no chance to bingo, but he has chances to score points. So 
What do you think, Charles? Burn the second blank to take a 50-point lead with Weighty? Or do you look elsewhere and maybe play just VID and Quited? Do you look to a different quadrant of the board completely? Do you play VIG above Tulip? But this is hard. What would you do? Uh, so Quite was uh, pretty straightforward because the Q has no future really on this board. If you can score 70-ish points with it, you do it. Um, Math, Matthew's letters here, while not very good, do have a small amount of future that the Q does not have. Like the Q is just so bad. Meanwhile, if uh, Matthew plays VID and Quited, WGY has a decent chance of scoring next turn and keeps the blank. Uh, so it, it would be a close call for me. He does not do either play. He might be keeping the D back for quieted plays next turn. That is a little bit dangerous given the amount of Ds in the pool. Um, and we see Ben just immediately pounce on that spot. So possibly, maybe not a wrong play from Matthew, but it didn't work out for him. Uh, just too many Ds for that play to make sense. I think Matthew needed to play weighty last turn and he's gonna get hit back now by Ben. Ben takes the lead with that play, 36 points for undo. This EEO leave is spicy, but now everything makes sense. We see the challenge on Quieted. So Matthew wasn't sure on that word, and that certainly changes the calculus on a play like Weighty. If it does come back, you've given your opponent all this free information that you have the blank. Uh, yeah, you can't pull the trigger on Weighty unless you're certain it's a word. So Vig, with this challenge, makes more sense. Ben's going to pick up five additional points as in the CSW lexicon, that's how we do challenges. Five points if you're wrong, not a lost turn. Matthew's gonna get to make a play anyway this turn. F-I-D-G-W-Y blank, geez, they are gonna run out of tiles that score a lot of points in this game eventually. They have just had so many of these ugly high scoring tiles, uh, you know, BOH, Tomb, and the last several plays, uh, for sure. I'll try to get the Unseen Pool displayed if Matthew doesn't play quickly here, and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. So when we get this pool on display, you'll see a number of things. Um, there are only two vowels unseen to Matthew that are not E's. There are six E's unseen, um, and an A and an O, and that is it. He has already the last I. He has a bunch of these consonants. There's a lot more consonants in the bag, and the only relief he'll find is an E, probably. So you need to be thinking about what consonants am I keeping, and when I do draw an E, what what is that going to give me? These are wild situations. It's always fascinating to watch players adjust or fail to adjust their game based on the unseen pool but this one's a rather interesting one what would you do with this pool with all of those e's unseen and very few scoring consonants uh, uh at first glance uh, all those e's in the bag do, do make the d on matthew's rack more valuable for ed bingos but it's worth noting that there is not an easy place to play an ED seven letter word on this board. And as I'm looking at the available bingo spots, I'm thinking that that Y actually does have uh, an uncommon um, usefulness here because it plays next to the U of undo making U. And so that's really one of the few remaining spots for seven letter words is if you could uh, get one ending in a Y. So keeping the Y here makes a little bit more sense than it usually does. And Gauf is a, a good way to get rid of some of those clunky letters, the G and the F we've discussed before. They don't like each other. The W and the G don't like each other. Playing all of those off is a good thing. Unfortunately, blocks some of the more lucrative bingo spots as well, which Matthew does not want to do. Let's check out this unseen pool. It's about to come on display. This is wild for Ben. What's missing, Charles? Well, I would, the Q is missing, but all, all, those, all those vowels are <laughs> sitting on Ben's rack. They are not in the pool. 
this is a situation where you have to be like, oh my God, I'm so angry. I just drew this terrible rack. And then you look at what's unseen and you're like, this is gold. This is an absolutely golden rack. So oh, I don't think you can put the A down here if you're Ben. You need to retain your vowels, especially the case A here. It's so valuable. I think you play Olay. This is also free information for Matthew. Matthew now knows I am not getting another vowel this game, more than likely, as a play like Olia through an L indicates you're probably holding three more vowels. Uh, I would not have put the A on the end of this play. I would have thought a lot harder about the pool. Uh, I would have done a lot of different things, but maybe Ben hasn't noticed just how unbalanced the unseen pool is. I think that was a rushed turn, and this may cost Ben big time. Yeah, definitely. Even just from the perspective, you keep the A, you just get more flexibility that three E's does not give you. It's, and Ben um, found the last E in the bag as well, so this is oh, even wow. crazier. So Matthew comes back very quickly with D-I-D-Y. This is crucial that he doesn't play off his I and that he's able to score points. There's only one vowel left for Matthew to find. Uh, in the bag, now that we've seen Ben drew another E, C E E E E F L, the rack for Ben, and we'll work on getting unseen displayed again to y'all uh, from his perspective. Yeah, the, the only saving grace for Matthew here is he does have the blank. Uh, he's probably thinking at this point, that's not going to help me bingo. There's no point thinking about bingos or very minimal point thinking about bingos. I just need to use this blank to score enough points to win a tight end game, which we are indeed in a tight game. Only a three point lead for Ben. Uh, this is shaping up to be an exciting finish. All right, check me on my word knowledge, Charles. Did they take away the front hook to F-A-Y? Uh, yes, they did. We're not gonna say the word out loud, but that word is gone. That word is gone, okay. So, Ben, I think, once again, a rush decision here. Just kind of playing flea. You have 11 minutes. There's a wild bag situation. I, I'm going to not say anything else, but I think maybe Ben needs to take more time on this turn. Flea for 19 is going to be his move. Yeah, I, I think it, it might end up being the correct move. I do think he could take a little bit more time here. Then again, there's not many spots to play on this board at this point. We've we've seen with Vig and Jig and and uh, Didi coming down, you're, you're just sort of out of spots to score. And the only other place he might be looking at is possibly playing Cleep, C-L-E-E-P to the P of Prairie. Otherwise, your scoring options are limited. You can't play Cleep. You can't string that E out in a way that lets my opponent play a bunch of consonants and score points. There are two tiles left in the bag in this game. Uh, Matthew trails by 22. It is his turn. He has the blank on his rack. And I am trying to figure out if there's anything he can do, Hail Mary-wise, to, to catch back up into this game. But that pool is so bad. His rack is so bad. So uh, one thought I have, <clears throat> which we know might not work out for him, but could work out from Matthew's perspective, is just playing Kit, K-I-T, on top of Vig, going for like Thistle with an E draw, making Skit. Um, that has sort of an out outside chance of working out, but Ben's going to try to disrupt that if he's able to. So it, it's it's an option. Do I think it's a really good or likely option? No, but maybe it's his only option. I'm not sure at this point. So Kit is going to lose even if he picks up that E. Thistle's just not going to... Uh, it, it's going to get blocked because Ben is going to have the S, but Thistle wins maybe if Matthew draws the S. So maybe Matthew has to just pray that the S is in the bag um, and that he fishes a K, draws the S. If Ben doesn't have the S and he plays Kit, well... What can Ben do to block? He can't make a J-A or J-O play. There's no A's and no O's. Uh, I think he could this do something is... like J-E-E, -E, um, but I don't think that gives back eights. I'd have to run it, but um, that would be an option to at least try to disrupt it. Instead, we see Matthew play just text, which you know is a good one-tile fish other than what does he hit? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that there's anything he can hit at this point in the game, especially knowing what we know about Ben's rack. But um, Ben now going to have an interesting choice of his own to make here. The equity play is the four letter E C C E um, playing next to F E, but there's no way you can make that play with an H on your opponent's rack. It's worth noting here that uh, neither player needs to bingo. Like Matt, Matthew could just outscore in the end game and win. And text <clears throat> might be just his way of starting to score enough points to win an end game outright without a bingo. We'll get the unseen pool displayed from Ben's perspective. This is one where he will definitely take some time after a play like text. You know, obviously my opponent is sitting on this blank. You wouldn't do that otherwise. Uh, but is there any threat that I'm worried about? What is his highest scoring option here? Can he bingo? Do I need to block a bingo? Uh, lots going on for Ben in his head right now. Uh, this is a challenging position, but according to the computer, Ben has 200% wins and one of them make any sense. So I'm going to have to try to learn some words. I don't know Collins well enough to understand why this makes sense. Quackle wants, oh, I see. Okay. Quackle really likes a one tile fish from Ben here. It wants him to extend A-W-E to A-W-E-E -E for seven. And I think the reason it likes that is because Ben bingos a decent amount of the time. Obviously, he picks up the blank, he'll bingo. If he picks up the H, he has screech and texts for like 110. And I don't even know that Matthew can block that without burning the blank for like nothing. Quackle's got one other 100% win for Ben. This one makes a lot more sense. Um, it is just SEC and texts, and apparently that is enough. But Ben has a lot to think about here. If there's not a bingo that's coming down in this game, I need to go out next turn to maximize my chances of winning this game. So whatever I play now, I'm going to draw one tile, and I need to figure out how I can go out with that one tile next turn. If I play creep to the P in Prairie, I'm going to hold on to SEC. What are the one tile draws I can pull? The H, the I, the K, the L, the N, the R, the T, and the blank. What can I do with each of those? Can I go out next turn? Matthew, obviously going to be looking to do his own out into. Um, so Ben needs to beat him out and try to catch him with some of that stuff on his rack, the H or the K, or at least force him to play off both the H and the K um, and go out next turn. This is a very tough situation for Ben. The engine says this game is won but we are not engines over the Scrabble board. We are people with brains and no calculators, and we can't see all the options that quickly. Lots for Ben to think about here. Yeah, it looks like he has um, Cersei set up, C-E-R-C-I to the Eye of Prairie, which I think would be a ploy to try to go out into um, making texts and uh, something like something, a four letter word there next turn. That seems to be, he's leaning towards it. He was getting ready to play it. Um, he also probably draws uh, a few outs on top of the R of Cersei. So, but he would need to figure out, is that enough to win? Does Matthew have something high scoring that nullifies my out and two sequence? And as Matt mentioned, at this point, you kind of do have to go through each letter in the bag. There's not too many in the bag. It's eight. You still have to do a lot. A workable amount of work just to figure out, you know, the percent of winning. He probably, by double checking his tracking, making sure he understands which letters enable him to win the game. And if it's not enough of those letters, try to find something else that, you know, wins more often. So you got to look through each of those eight unseen tiles for Ben. If you play C-E-R-C-I, you're holding E-E-S. If you pull the blank, you're going to win. If you pull the H, you've got two plays. You've got down to this R. If you pull the I, uh, Matthew's rack is so bad, you're, you're probably going to win, but that might be lazy analysis. 
If you draw the K, you have seek or ski, S-K-E-E, -E, in multiple spots. You're going to win if you draw that. If you draw the L, you have seal, S-E-E-L, in text. That's going to win. The N is going to give you esna or seen. That's going to win. The R, seer, seer, that's going to win. The T, uh, what's going to happen if you draw the T? Well, you've got steer after this. You've got steep. Um, does T-E-E-S play anywhere? I don't know. Matthew may be able to abstract the uh, the out on that one, but we know what's in the bag. It's the N, and Ben's going to be very happy to draw that. I think Ben is on hold here. He hasn't drawn his tile, but has hit his clock. And, of course, Matthew's going to do his math. I don't know this word 100%. If this costs me the game, I've got to challenge it, right? Um, so Matthew's going to do the math. He's down 18. He's going to do his tracking. Realize E-E-N-S is on Ben's rack. Realize he has no chance to win as E-S-N-E and -E texts is an awesome outplay for Ben. And uh, that's going to be the end for this one. Yeah, what's what's best, Matthew's best play here? Is it just hiker and <clears throat> keep um, LRT and just... Uh, kind of roll over. Uh, the best play for Matthew takes away Ben's best out of Esna and texts for 27. Oh, yes. So yep. I'll give you that puzzle and see who can figure it out from here. This was a, a really interesting game, and people who play more NWL who are watching looks a lot like an NWL game. It doesn't look as much like the cons games that we're used to seeing. A lot of really tight, overlapping plays, not just uh, bingo bonanza like a cons game can sometimes turn out to be. Uh, so this is a uh, a cannon fired across, you know, the ship towards all Collins naysayers that there's no strategy involved with Collins. They're, they're, games like this can get very tight and very tactical. Oh yeah, there's no strategy in Collins is, is a huge lie. I mean, after watching the, the World Championship and commenting every single game on it, man, there was some brilliant, brilliant stuff. Yeah, sometimes your opponent just scores 550 and it feels like that happens a lot, but at the same time, strategy is by no means dead in this game, not at all. There's the challenge we knew was going to happen. Optimal end game for Matthew is to take away uh, Esna and Texts and to play something like Shtick or Shirk. But Caliph is just a point behind that, and he spotted this play. Uh, good board vision there for Matthew, realizing his best end game. But this puts him up by 10. Esna is going to score seven or 27 for Ben and catch him with four on his rack. And uh, that's the end of this one. Oh, Ben is not even playing ESNE. He's just going to play scene instead. We've seen Ben do this a number of times. Uh, forget spread. Let me just win. 